If you are serious about your portfolio for 2024, then get yourself to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference in Vancouver, British Columbia on January 21st and 22nd. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference channel. My name is Jesse Day. We're counting down to the VRIC. It's coming up January 21st and 22nd. There's a link in the description where you can get your tickets. But of course, we are bringing the VRIC to you with our online series of expert panels. And today we're going to be talking about all things energy. And for that, I'm joined by Steve St. Angelo of the SRS Rocco Report where he talks about how energy will impact precious metals, mining, and the economy. And Brian Gitt, author of In the Dark, Fixing Energy Policies That Hurt People and the Planet. Gentlemen, it's an honor to have you on the channel. Uh, it's great to be here, Jesse. Uh, lots to talk about, so it's uh, going to be a quite interesting conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Jesse. Great. Well, we're going to focus first on what isn't working when it comes to the global energy picture and then talk about solutions to the problems the world is currently facing. Brian, I know you're a proponent for nuclear energy and you believe that could be the answer. Steve, you have some reservations about that. So we'll look forward to perhaps a bit of a friendly debate on that later. But for now, let's focus on the so-called new green economy and the push for eliminating fossil fuels and using more so-called renewable energy, wind, solar, etc. Is this plan as it's currently being proposed realistic? And what are the main issues you see with how it's being executed? And Steve, I'll start with you on this one. Well, you know, we've seen the first uh, round of this. I call it uh, Europe hit the energy cliff with natural gas first uh, two years ago, even before the Russian-Ukraine war. As they've ramped up uh, wind and solar, and they started cutting back on nuclear and coal. They needed a, 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 this natural gas was very important to, to make all that work. And so they they actually are the largest net importers of natural gas. So when natural gas got into trouble, it, it hurt Europe first. And so I, I think what's going on is more and more countries, as they're transitioning more towards wind and solar, which they call renewable, they're not really renewable. They're just like a water heater or a dishwasher. These things have to be replaced after 15, 25 years. And so the issue is, as they continue to ramp this wind and solar up in their electricity grid, it becomes increasingly problematic. And so I think going forward, while we do burn less natural gas and coal when you use wind and solar, so that's one of the positives on a short term, the negatives are going to be the long-term, mid to long-term problems we're going to have with this ramping up green energy, wind and, and solar, because it's it won't be sustainable. And I think, and of course, it's all manufactured by burning mostly fossil fuels. And so I, I think this is the problem that people need to understand, that you, you cannot continue to ramp these up without burning a lot of coal and natural gas and, and oil. Yeah, that is a point that a lot of people don't pay attention to. Brian, your thoughts on the current state of the energy transition? You know, we had COP28 recently, maybe if, if you have any comments on that, um, and, and just the issues that you see uh, being faced at present with uh, this push for eliminating fossil fuels. I think most of our policymakers are fixated on the wrong goal. Everyone's focused on net zero emissions when ultimately I think we should be focused on how do we use 500% more energy? You know, 47% of the world still lives in energy poverty, meaning they don't have enough energy today to live the quality of life that the three of us are um, privileged enough to have. And when we look forward, like what are we trying to achieve here? I mean, ultimately, if we zoom all the way out, I think most reasonable people would agree that we want to increase the quality of, of life and well-being for the maximum number of people. And we want to minimize the impact on our environment. I mean, no one wants to breathe bad air or drink bad polluted water or anything like that. So if those are our aims, what are the most effective technologies to get us to achieve those aims? And right now at COP28, and you hear this nonstop drumbeat of net zero emissions, net zero emissions. Well, I just categorically think it's the wrong goal, not because we shouldn't reduce our emissions. I think we should continue to climb the ladder of energy density and use less polluting, less emitting sources of energy. And 
all developed countries have gone through this metamorphosis. I mean, we all start out burning dirty wood, and when then we move to coal, there's more energy dense and much more productive, and then we started using natural gas, and then we started nu using nuclear energy. And I think it's a natural evolution of any economy and any society as they become more prosperous, they're going to use better, cleaner forms of energy. And so I categorically think we're focused on the wrong metric. And as we know, when we're focused on the wrong goal, we might just hit it, right? So we got to be really careful. And I, I think it's very dangerous direction that we're going in right now. Yeah, there was an article released recently, I forget uh, the exact publication, but they were talking about how research has been done to show that humans breathing now is a contributor to climate change by some certain percentage. And they actually, there was actually a study that looked into this, which is completely insane. So I'm just wondering, is there something sinister at all behind this agenda being pushed? It, you obviously have people who some would call conspiratorial minded saying, okay, well, the, the political elites are looking to reduce the population. So they're easier to control. They're looking to just lower standards of living in general. So people can't really pay attention to what the government do is doing in a move to consolidate power. Um, so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are there. Is this just ignorance on the part of these politicians? Is it just the fact that they're thinking in terms of election cycles and the push for renewable energy in the new green economy just happens to be a trend they're currently riding um, that perhaps will allow them to continue to stay in power. And uh, Brian, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. Well, the energy system is complex, as we can all agree. And I think the motivations of the people engaged in decision making is also equally complex. And so I don't think we can distill it down to a, a simple black and white answer of, and I actually don't think that the majority of people have mal intent. I think that the majority of people are acting from a place of either ignorance or from just following their own incentives. You you mentioned politicians as an example. Well, they're following the incentive structure to get reelected. And so they're going to parrot whatever views, oftentimes, that are most likely going to get them reelected. And right now, I think there's there's four foundational myths that underlie a lot of these energy policies that we're seeing manifest across the world. I mean, the first myth, I think, is that fossil fuels are being phased out when clearly they're not. I mean, we are fossil fuels are growing three times faster than renewable energy over the last 20 years. And we're very much likely to use more fossil fuels in 2050 than we are today. So they're certainly not, and we can argue about, we can use more or less of different types of fossil fuels, but in general, the trend is higher. I mean, 12% of all of the oil today is, is going towards petrochemicals and those are going to double by, you know, you look at S and P global forecast, et cetera. So the world is going to use a lot more energy and the world's going to use a lot more fossil fuels. So that's clearly a myth that that is, is not true, right? Then another myth, I think, is this fact that solar, wind, and electric vehicles are the best way to reduce emissions. When I, I, I just categorically, objectively, that's false. I mean, we, you, could, we, you can measure this in terms of CO2 emissions, you can, in terms of impact on the environment, these technologies are grossly inefficient and are not the best way to reduce emissions. And we can talk more about that, but for now, I'll just kind of leave it there. But that is a axiomatic view of a lot of the people that hold this. It's, those are the technologies that are going to lead us to net zero emissions or lower environmental impact. The third view, I think, is that nuclear power isn't safe when we have 70 years of commercial safe operation um, of nuclear power plants around the world. And then the last and the most pernicious, and, and by the way, I used to believe all these. So I, I'm not casting judgment or blame or saying these people are bad or anything like this. I think it's really coming from deep-rooted ignorance in most of these areas. The last is that when we use more energy, that we damage the environment. When that's absolutely false. I mean, in every society around the world, as we have harnessed more energy and use more energy, we've shrunk our environmental footprint, protected our water, protected our air, and made quality of life better, not only for humans, but also shrunk our environmental footprint overall. Um, and we're not chopping down our forests for, for wood fuel to, to heat our homes and to cook our food. And it goes on and on. But I'll pause there. But it's really important because these foundational myths are driving decision making and policy internationally around the world right now. Um, it is what we're seeing today. Very interesting thoughts there. And Steve, um, 
what do you think about the agenda behind this and also how the public seems to have been captured in terms of believing a lot uh, of these myths that Brian alluded to. I mean, when I'm doing research for for YouTube, sometimes I'm out of curiosity, I check search terms. What have people been searching for? And, and you know, I'm I'm very interested in the oil and gas industry, and I, I often do interviews with with guests such as yourself who know a lot about the industry. And so when I'm looking for search terms on oil and gas and, and fossil fuels, et cetera, it, the search volume is so low on YouTube compared to renewable energy, climate change, solar power, wind power. It's it's a massive gap. It's like 10x. So I'm, I'm just wondering, do you think that zeitgeist will change eventually? Will people wake up? And um, how, how, how is it that this th- these ideas have spread throughout so many cultures? Well, it's probably due to what I call the uh, Star Trek Amazon replicator economy. And if you've seen Star Trek movies, uh, they have the replicator where you push a button if you want coffee or you need a pair of shoes, you push a button. And so today, if you're... American and you or in Europe and other parts of the world, if you want to buy something, you go on Amazon, you, you push a button, and in one or two days, you can have it right there in your doorstep. So it's we, we have no idea what it takes to run the global supply chain, the amount of energy that is consumed on a daily basis. So I would agree with I would agree with Brian that the interesting thing about ramping up uh, wind and solar, people call them green, they're not really green. Now a wind turbine does not have black smoke coming out of the top of its, you know, of, of the wind turbine, like a coal fire plant might. So it looks clean, but it's an, it's like a Hollywood illusion. If you go back to supply chain and you see how all the materials, raw materials and energy that was used to, to produce that wind turbine, it, it's a very dirty process, uh, especially a lot of the rare earth minerals that go into it. And so I think this is this is the illusion is that we really, a lot of people are kind of ignorant. And even these very highly trained uh, engineers that are I- increasing wind power and higher and larger wind turbines and bigger solar panel farms, they actually, a lot of them believe that this is cutting back on fossil fuels. So it, the world is so complex, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And so when you're a very intelligent solar engineer, you don't really see what it takes to produce that solar panel and and what happens. And so it looks like when you put that solar panel up, it's producing electricity. It looks like it's it's clean. So I think the issue is there's a lot of ignorance. I I do agree with that. And there's a lot of self-interest. I think Warren Buffett has increased a lot of wind power due to the tax subsidies that, that he gets from wind power. So going forward, the problem is, I call it, when a lot of these wind turbines are going to have to be replaced, it's going to be this, this, uh, this, this treadmill. We've added so many new wind turbines. In 15 years, those, the, all they have to be replaced. The, the issue is going to come forward. We're not going to have the energy really to replace those, as well as the solar. So it comes down to an issue that right now, the, the wind, green, wind, and solar is kind of working. It's causing a lot of problems with a volatile grid. But as time goes on, Jesse, this movement into wind and solar and EVs is going to become much more disruptive. And unfortunately, a lot of the leaders and the people who are manufacturing and installing this, they I don't think they really understand that, that issue. But that's still five, 10 years down the road. The era of globalization has now come to an end. Countries and corporations are right now racing to secure the materials they need for their supply chains. If you are serious about your portfolio for 2024, then get yourself to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference in Vancouver, British Columbia on January 21st and 22nd. Yeah. And a lot of these politicians will be out of power by then. The grift will be completed and they'll move on to some high paying position at some organization. And and that'll be that for them. They'll be happy with that. So, um, Brian, I want to touch on a tweet you recently made. You said leaders at the COP28 summit want to phase out fossil fuels by 2050. That's like phasing out oxygen. Food, healthcare, housing, and sanitation all rely on fossil fuels. Billions will die without low-cost fuel for fertilizer, heating, plastic, steel, 
and cement. So I'll pose this question to both of you, focusing specifically on the fossil fuels issue. Obviously, I think you're both betting against that for the most part. Um, So what do you think the future holds for the fossil fuels when it comes to all of it, oil, natural gas, and coal as energy sources? Are we going to see all of them ramp up moving forward as emerging economies, for example? some A lot of people start to move into the middle class and consume more energy. Could we see something like coal eventually get phased out, but oil and natural gas remain? Uh, what are your thoughts there? And uh, Steve, I'll go to you first on this one. You're, I, well, I look at the energy oil market a little different than many people. I, I think we're going to get into trouble with the uh, most important, the conventional oil. And actually, if you look at conventional oil, this is the higher quality oil, uh, the higher energy return on investment oil. That has peaked in 2006. And even though we've seen almost new highs in total liquid production, petroleum, a lot of that's natural gas liquids. Unfortunately, you can't make diesel with natural gas liquids, and the global supply chain is run on diesel. And so that comes mainly from conventional oil. So the issue going forward is, uh, I think we're going to continue, possibly increase more oil production overall. That's also including tight oil, heavy oil, oil sands. What's going to increase likely is like the natural gas liquids and even natural gas for a while. But I think the problem moving forward after 2025, I think we're going to start to get into more trouble with liquid oil production. And this is due to my analysis of, of the decline rates. And so even though we'll get more natural gas liquids and, and more uh, natural gas production, that isn't going to help us with our global supply chain, which is basically what runs everything because we don't put gasoline in a huge container ship. It's run on diesel. So I think these are the issues that I look, I'm more concerned with oil and and, uh, and the liquid fuels than I am with electricity. Well, we definitely will dive into your thesis on the energy cliff in a moment here. But um, first, Brian, uh, your thoughts on how the use, usage of fossil fuels will evolve or not moving forward. Well, I think the genesis of that tweet really comes from the um, the objective fact that fossil fuels, whether we like it or not, are embedded in our whole society in every aspect of our supply chain. You know, ninety six percent of every manufactured good in the world is made from fossil fuels, right? Um, there, that's how we grow our food. That's how we get uh, everything transported everywhere. So, I, I just don't see a scenario where all of a sudden they're going away overnight. I mean, it just seems I, I don't see anything on the horizon. That would allow that would replace them at scale and at a in a cost effective way. Now, and that's not to say that we won't have shortages of specific aspects, specific types of, of fossil fuels in different locations. I'm I'm not arguing that point, and I think we can get into that more of that later. But I think we it's dangerous to view this category of fossil fuels is one kind of lumped category, just as it's dangerous to say renewable energy is a category, which both these categories are kind of meaningless, right? I mean, when we talk about renewable energy, what we're really talking about is hydroelectric, we're talking about wind, we're talking about solar, we're talking about geothermal. There's not anything that's really renewable energy. And the same thing on fossil fuels. I mean, we have to break it down uh, and look at, well, we're talking natural gas liquids, we're talking oil, we're talking coal, Etc. And so I think ultimately the world is going to use more and more energy. And I think that's a good thing. Um, I think that's a trajectory. I mean, everyone on the, the 1 billion people on the planet today that have uh, live with the quality of lifestyle that we do and have access to warm showers and, and refrigerated food and don't have to basically cook on a wood fire. I think the rest of the world wants that. And I think they deserve it. And I think they're going to get it one way or another, no matter how much uh, politicians or pundits want to tell them to not consume as much energy, I don't think that's going to be a realistic path. So I think we will consume more energy. And right now, I think fossil fuels are the only viable cost-effective way in the near term to achieve it. Now, it depends on the timeframes that we're talking about, because that's really important. I mean, I'm a big proponent of nuclear energy. I think ultimately it's inevitable and we will be a nuclear-powered civilization. Will that happen in five years or 10 years? No. I mean, it, we're, we're many decades away from that evolution. It's going to happen over time. 
fossil fuels are going to be the bedrock of foundation for for many decades to come, although we will transition from different types of fossil fuels to others to supplement them. And I think it's a very much in regional context. Um, energy ultimately, although oil is a global commodity, a lot of these are regional in nature. I mean, even natural gas to some degree, even though we're getting much better at compressing it and transporting it around the world, it's still, um, there's a major arbitrage between the cost of natural gas in the United States and the cost of natural gas in Europe, right? It's not the same. So, Ultimately, we have to look through a local lens when we talk about, well, are we going to use more or less fossil fuels? Because I think the story is different if you're in China, if you're in the United States, or you're in Europe. Absolutely. Well, Steve, I want to touch on a tweet you made recently where you said, well, Permian productivity has increased over the past five years. It has been rolling over for the last two. Unfortunately, three-mile laterals only extract the oil faster with steeper declines. The companies are blowing the guts out of their wells for free cash flow. So talk to us about the declines you're seeing when it comes to U.S. shale oil production and your theory on the energy cliff. And then I'd like to get Brian's take, because Brian, you're saying we're going to be using more fossil fuels as we move out. In 2050, we'll be using more than today. Steve, you're saying that perhaps that might not be possible. So um, give, give us your theory there. And then uh, I'll, I'll, Brian, I'll get your uh, your take on it as well. Well, Jesse, I, I always like to go by the numbers. The numbers kind of tell me what's going on. I, I don't try to find information to fill my assumption or what I think. I look at the numbers and they kind of tell me what's going on. So I, I got a, a few charts and one is the Permian average well cumulative oil production for the first three months. And that's per thousand feet of lateral. Now, a Wall Street Journal article came out and said since the last five years, that the uh, productivity has increased 59%. They're talking about per well. But to do that, we went from uh, like one mile, one and a half mile laterals. Now we're doing three mile laterals. And before, like in the Permian, we were pumping in 11 million pounds in a well. Now we're pumping in 12 million pounds of fracking sand to get the oil out. And so if you look at this chart of the Permian, you're going to see the, the, the first three months from 2018 to 2023. And what you're going to see is it peaked in about the first quarter of 2021. So it peaked in 2021 and it's been rolling over. And, and so what that tells me, even though they're going to longer three mile laterals, the efficiency when you get to a longer three mile lateral, and so they, they drill down about a mile, and then they go out about three miles to do this. That's, they drill the well, and then they have to frack it. To get to that last mile in that three-mile lateral, it's less and less efficient. And so the productivity is declining. And so you could see that as this, the oil per well has been declining since 2021. And also, furthermore, to get more free cash flow, they were doing what they call uh, choke management. And so they would allow so much oil to come out in the beginning stage. Now they're allowing a lot more oil to come out in the initial first month or two. And what happens is some of that fracking sand starts coming back out of the, with the water, they produce a lot of water. Matter of fact, for every 100 barrels of oil, they're getting three to 400 barrels of water. And with that comes the prop in the fracking sand. So they're, they're pulling a lot of that out of of the, the formations, which is the guts of the well. And this, in the longer term, is going to hurt the efficiency. They're going to actually leave more oil in, in that well than they could have gotten in the area. So the next chart shows you the Eagle Ford. That's the green chart. And you could see in the Eagle Ford, the productivity declined back in 2019. And it's really starting to come down. And so these, this isn't not what I'm telling you what's happening. This is what the, the data is showing. So we have gone through the highest quality locations, most of them, and we're, we still have more. But the problem with shale, it declines between 43 and 45% a year. That's the problem with shale. You've got to replace that every year. So if you're producing about seven and a half, eight million 8 million barrels a year from shale, 40, 45%, you've got to replace 3.5 million barrels just to to get back to even. And we've been doing that and growing it because we, we were going into new fields. Now these fields, you should see how they're getting used up. I, I look at some of these fields like the Bakken where all the wells are 
it's amazing. You could see the field is just getting totally inundated by wells. And so even though there's more locations left, these aren't going to last forever. And so the what's happening with the shale industry is what I call it, it's the red queen syndrome. And if you look at the Permian, the, the growth has mostly come from New Mexico Permian. And it's starting to roll over. So when it starts to roll over, it can be in a plateau for a while. But this is the problem that most people don't understand about the oil industry. I call it the energy cliff. We're hitting the Red Queen syndrome. The world is losing now that we're running at 100 million barrels of oil production per day. We're losing between 10 to 11 million barrels a day every year. We have to replace Saudi Arabia every year. That's the numbers. I've done the numbers on it. So let's say we're going to get it up to 105 or 110 million barrels a day. I don't think we'll get there. We may with natural gas liquids or other things briefly. But then if you get it up to 105, 110 million barrels a day, now you're losing 11, 12, 13 million barrels a day of declines. People don't get the numbers. Unfortunately, we are running out of the, the, these reserves to replace this kind of decline rate. And so this is where I differ from many people. Even though we want to use oil and fossil fuels, the problem is we're starting to run against the limits of what we can replace this declining production. And I think we start to hit that, especially after 2025. So I said a lot, but I, that's my analysis of hitting this energy cliff and the problems we're going to have with growing production in the future. And Brian, your thoughts, are you seeing any similar challenges when it comes to new fossil fuels being brought online as we move forward here? And um, if if not, uh, how, how do you think uh, current oil uh, reserves existing on the earth and potential future discoveries could perhaps create a different scenario than what Steve has described? Well, I would agree that there's lots of challenges ahead and that there's certain, certainly some of the existing wells are, we're using up that resource, right? And, and we're going to have to find new capacity. I think the the chronic problem, and there are many problems, but the biggest problem is under investment, right? It's under investment in new exploration and production. Um, the technology is getting better and better. They're able to squeeze more out for less energy, less work. That's always going to, I think, can continue to increase. I mean, that's human nature that we get better and better and better at doing things. But ultimately, if we're not investing the time, energy, and resources to go find more, we're not going to find more, right? I mean, there's no light. There is plenty of oil, natural gas. Liquid. There's there's thousands of years of fossil fuels waiting. Now, it's just a matter of how much does it cost? And what is the technology we have to access it? But there's certainly no lack of fossil fuels on planet Earth. I mean, we barely even started to scrape the surface of, of looking for them. I mean, most of the Earth is covered in oceans, and it doesn't make sense economically for us to go and explore there because we haven't had to, right? But as the price, and I do agree that the price of these critical commodities is likely to go higher because we will hit a cliff because we're not investing enough in exploration and production to meet the demand. And we know that the demand is rising. So I agree that there's lots of challenges ahead. I agree that we are depleting a lot of our existing, our existing conventional wells. But I don't agree that this will long term overall, and there will be peaks and valleys and, and many challenges and a lot of volatility. I definitely think that that is the case. And there'll be a lot of pain that will experience by it, unfortunately, the people that will have the least amount of resources to withstand that pain, unfortunately, and especially in developing countries or lower income households are going to have to pay more for energy until we get those demand signals are so strong and so politically overpowering that we start investing the money in exploration production again. This is also assuming that we don't find other replacements. I mean, over time, I think we will adapt and find cost-effective replacements. Up to this point, there really hasn't been a driving need. I mean, one of the reasons nuclear power hasn't really taken off is because it's there's lots of reasons we can go into later. But one of the reasons is, well, energy has been relatively cheap, accessible, convenient for many decades. And in areas like the United States and Europe, we weren't even growing our load. So why would you invest in new technology, right? Until you have to. And then there is a correction. It takes time and it takes a lot of um, resource to kind of build that capacity back up. So I, I believe that's what's going to happen with hydrocarbons. I think there's no lack of hydrocarbons on the planet. It's just a matter of 
cost to extract it and the technology available. And I think the cost will go up and the technology will get better. And we will learn how to extract more of it out as well as find additional replacements for portions of it. So, Steve, I, I'll throw it back to you briefly to to give yeah. a bit of a rebuttal to that, because that is also an argument I hear come up um, in response to the energy cliff theory is that, well, all we need is for the price of oil to go up to a certain amount and then w exploration in new regions will open up, we'll find new deposits that maybe right now aren't economically feasible to extract, but they will become that way at $200 oil, $300 oil, or whatever the price may be. And then we'll we'll shift focus to, to discussing nuclear after, but um, your, your thoughts on what Brian said. No, and you know, we could talk about this for a couple hours. I guess the, the best way to, to understand and clarify, because the devil's in the details. I do agree with Brian. There is so much fossil fuels. There's trillions of barrels of, of methane hydrates if you want to try to extract that. We've got oil shale. If you want to get that out of the ground, that's in Utah. The problem is this, and it's simple to understand. When the United States start tapping into its wonderful oil, when John Rockefeller was starting to tap in, the average energy return on investment from the oil back then, oil and gas, was 100 to 1. So the cost of one barrel of oil you could extract 100 barrels. By 1970, this fell to 30 to 1. Uh, in, the, in the early 2000s, it was down to 10 to 1. Shale oil, tide oil, is 5 to 1. Oil sands is 4 to 1. So when you understand that we have been going through the high energy return on investment oil, even and then oil shale in Utah is less than 2 to 1, and if you want to try to extract the, the trillions of barrels of methane hydrates off the coasts of all the, the, the countries and regions around the world, there's trillions of barrels of that equivalent there. It's like 1.3 to 1. Japan stopped trying to extract that. It just was never economic. And here, here's the clincher. Our modern, high-tech global economy, if you want to have cars, entertainment, hospitals, schools, all these different aspects, you have to have at least a 12 to 1 energy return on investment from your oil. At least a 12 to 1. When you start going to offshore, it gets less. The energy return on investment falls. When you go up to the Arctic, like Russia is trying to do, it, trying to deal with Arctic frigid temperatures, this is what people don't realize. It's not and, it, and, and unless we had zero interest rates in the United States, shale couldn't have been extracted because they had to have so much debt. They, they couldn't produce it profitably. They had to use a lot of debt, and that was only feasible with like very low interest rates. And so this is the issue that is totally misunderstood. While I do agree with Brian, there are trillions of barrels of oil equivalent out there. Unfortunately, we can we would go we would bankrupt this global economy trying to access it because we need at least 10 to 12 to one energy return on investment from oil. And when you start to go to the Arctic, when you go to ultra deep water to get this oil, you're not doing it on land. That just goes to show you we have run out of the high quality energy return on investment oil. Even though there's some still out there, it, it's a lot less than what people realize. And I think this is the most important thing that people don't understand about what we're facing moving forward. Well, we certainly could go back and forth on this for a while, but <laughs> yes. this is why I love talking to different experts in, in, in the energy space like both of you, because I think the real winner is the viewer who can hear the different opinions, do their own research, and kind of come to their own conclusions. So let's switch to nuclear energy now, um, which a lot of people are pointing to as a solution to you know the current lack of energy in the developing world, what many are terming an energy crisis. Um, and it seems to be in that sweet spot where the climate fanatics and the, the political elites who are pushing the ESG agenda have now fully embraced nuclear energy where they used to vilify it. Um, so, Brian, I know you're a big proponent of nuclear energy. I am as well. I believe nuclear is the future, but I'm also very overweight uranium equities in my portfolio. So show me the incentive. I will show you the outcome. So I might not be the best person to listen to on that. 
Um, and Steve, you think there are some issues with the world going nuclear. So uh, let's talk about it. Brian, make your case for why nuclear is the answer or one of the answers. And then um, Steve, we'll, we'll hear your thoughts after. Yeah, well, I, I, there's certainly no silver bullet, and I, I certainly don't want to portray nuclear as not having its challenges or, or constraints, because it certainly does. Um, but I think when we think about different energy technologies and energy sources from first principles, we have to think through, well, what are the evaluation criteria that we're using? How are Because everything is going to be compared to something else. If we're going to talk about nuclear, we can't just do it in, in isolation, we're having to compare it to natural gas or solar or wind or something else. And so to do that, I think you need clear evaluation metrics. And I think if we sat down, we could probably come to pretty quick agreement of what those metrics are. These are things like, all right, energy security, reliability, cost, safety, scalability, emissions, land use, water use, you know, you, you basically could sketch out, well, what are the criteria that we objectively would evaluate any of these technologies on? And we, when, we, when you actually would do that, I think nuclear has the potential, and this is what I, 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 it's important caveat, because I think in certain places of the world, nuclear makes tons of sense today, and in other places, not yet, due to I think some places need more economic development before it would be viable. But I think when you start evaluating metric by metric, I mean, I think from speed, cost, emissions, reliability, it wins on all these fronts, right? I mean, it really does when you think from first principles about how many kilograms of material have to go in to create a unit of energy in this. I mean, it's, it's a million times more efficient than fossil fuels, ultimately. And, and I just got done saying I'm a big proponent of fossil fuels. So I'm not anti-fossil fuels. It's just when you look at the underlying physics of it, so when you think about what is going to generate the most energy for the u the least amount of materials, the least amount of land, um, what is now holding it back? What are the objections to it? And I think there's, from a public perception, there's really two that it boils down to. It's, well, what do we do about the waste and what happens if, they're accident if there's an accident? No one wants to have a repeat of Chernobyl, Fukushima, Three Mile Island. Well, we already had those are solved problems today. Those are I understand that the public might not perceive them as solved because of just ignorance and not having updated their priors in terms of assumptions. But let's just take each one. So waste. Well, objectively, nuclear waste, commercial nuclear waste has never harmed a single human being in 70 years of commercial operation. It's a hundred percent contained in concrete stainless steel casks. And it doesn't pose really any threat. I mean, after 40 years, 99% of the radioactivity is gone, right? And after several hundred years, you'd have to eat it. You'd have to ingest it to cause any harm. So what are we even talking about? And just in the United States, where this is where the nuclear industry started, there's more nuclear reactors operating than anywhere in the world and have done so for 70 years. All of the nuclear waste from 70 years of commercial operation, which is powered approximately 20% of all of our electricity, could fit in a single Walmart supercenter um, overall. So it's not a lot of waste. And actually, I, I would take a contrarian view that that used fuel is actually not a problem. It's a gift. It's a gift to future generations because those 90,000 metric tons of spent fuel could power the United States at current consumption levels for the next 150 years. And we know how to recycle it. We know how to extract more energy out of it. So we have this raw, valuable resource that's sitting there that's not hurting anyone that actually is a huge benefit for society moving forward. So that's kind of on the waste side. On the concern about safety and accidents, I certainly, we, we need safe regulation, just like any power source needs to be safe and it needs to be regulated appropriately. But the nuclear industry is this, I, I would argue, is probably the safest industry on Earth. And from a occupational health perspective, on a death per terawatt hours produced perspective, any metric you want to give to it, it's just as safe as solar and wind um, when you actually look at the data. And most of the new advanced reactor designs... You can't physically melt down the fuel. It's impossible from a physics perspective. So the kinds of accidents that people are imagining are physically impossible with those designs because the passive inherent safety characteristics, meaning that you don't need backup power, right? So what happened with Fukushima is 
the tsunami came in. It knocked out the backup diesel generators that were circulating the coolant to keep the getting rid of the decay heat. Well, in these new advanced reactor designs, you don't need backup power. You could knock out complete power to the power plant. You could knock out all the humans. You don't need human intervention. And just using natural forces like gravity, natural convection, these things will cool off. So they don't really pose any human threat. So when you start breaking this down and looking into the the evaluation metrics of this from safety, obviously we just went into and cost, et cetera, the, it, it should be basically the cheapest, cleanest, most reliable way to generate energy. Now, that's not to say that it is everywhere in the world today, but most of the barriers are completely self-imposed. And it just takes a matter of political will to unlock that. And we're starting to see that shift happening internationally. So I'll pause there and um, we can kind of carry on from there. Yeah, sure. Uh, Steve, your your thoughts, what, what, do, what are the challenges that you see facing the proliferation of nuclear energy around the world? Jesse, the, the simplest way, I, I, my, I like KISS, keep it simple, stupid. The best way to understand the issues ramping up anything going forward is on the, bo- the back of fossil fuels. So if my forecast, we're going to get into trouble with fossil fuels, especially oil, because we have to remember China produces half of its power is it comes from burning coal. And so when you understand that, how do they get that coal to their coal fire plant? Well, they extract it with diesel machines. They put it on a barge or they put it on a rail that's powered by diesel. And so you need diesel to extract coal and transport coal. So without the oil, you can't really ramp up the coal. And so that's why oil is so important. So I always come back, my, my, the default mechanism is what happens with oil is going to impact everything else, especially like coal and natural gas in the future. So the issue going forward is the nuclear power plants are very complex machines, and they need a very complex global supply chain. Because believe it or not, even though we might put together or manufacture or, or uh, construct a nuclear power plant in the United States, a lot of those parts and equipment come from the global supply chain. So you need a very efficient global supply chain to provide those very complex parts. And I think as the oil gets into trouble, I think the global supply chain will get into trouble. And so it's going to be difficult to ramp up nuclear or even other renewables or green energy. So I think this is the this is the issue that is not really understood. And, and again, uh, Joseph Tainer wrote a, wrote a book, and he's ta- spoken a lot about this. It's called The Collapse of Complex Society. So if we stayed awake in history class and went back and looked at the, the collapse of the late Bronze Age and the ancient Roman Empire and the Greek Empire and the Mayan Empire, you'll notice a certain trend. They got very complex when they didn't have enough energy to continue the complexity of the system. It went back to being simple again. That's that's and so I think this is the issue we're facing. So we can get stuck in all the different nomenclature, all the different terms and complexities and technology. The problem is we're hitting the limits of the fossil fuel production. So to in- continue to in- increase very complex energy systems on a global infrastructure that continuing that continues to decay. That's another big factor. U.S. infrastructure is rated a a D plus or a C minus. We have to spend trillions of energy just to replace that. And so I think these are issues that no one is really looking at. We can we can think about ramping up nuclear, but we've got massive problems with our infrastructure that we're not even paying attention to. So I think that's where I stand on it. So a lot of that argument goes back to the energy cliff thesis which yes. we've discussed a little bit on both of your views there already. But Brian, I would like to maybe pose the question to you because one of the big pushbacks I've heard as well, tying into what Steve is saying to some extent is the cost of nuclear. Some people are saying that the cost to and and the energy input required to bring a nuclear reactor online from beginning to plan to actually having it fully operational. We've seen issues in some parts of the world with this already, Um, you know, some of these plants coming in well over budget and, and over schedule as well. Uh, Is, is this a challenge in your view and do you see a solution for it? 
Well, there's certainly many challenges. So I'm I'm not I'm not trying to paint a a, a rosy rose colored glasses picture. There's there's many challenges moving forward. But I did want to comment a little bit on the supply chain and kind of just the cost of energy and speed because most of these things are are self imposed and not necessary. So I'll give you an example. Um, a nuclear power plant. There's nothing. The the main thing that's exotic about it, especially these new advanced reactor designs. Are, are really just the access to the fuel, right? In terms of the level of enrichment that's needed, but the most of the materials are just commonly available off-the-shelf components. So the coal conventional island of the plant is just running Rankin-style steam turbines, right? That's just basically taking in the same. The, many of these designs operate at the same temperatures that a fossil fire power plant does. So you're basically taking that entire power conversion system off the shelf. There's nothing new, nothing exotic about it. Many of the designs also use, they don't require forged vessels in South Korea. Some of them do, right? I mean, it, it, these are design decisions. Um, some operate at zero atmospheric pressure, use commonly available materials like 304, 316 rolled steel that, you, that many domestic uh, manufacturers can make. All you're really doing with a nuclear power plant is a clever way to boil water. And then once you boil that water, everything else is basically the same as any other power plant. So the the main thing that is exotic today in this is the fuel, right? Is uranium, which ultimately is not exotic inherently. We have unfortunately uh, divested our supply chain and we need to build that back up domestically here in the United States, but there's nothing exotic. There's plenty of uranium in the world, right? So then the, the next pinch point is the enrichment capacity, the facilities that can take raw uranium rocks coming out of the ground at 0.7%. And moving that up to 10, 15, 19% enrichment levels that a lot of these newer reactor designs utilize. So that is scarce, but we know how to do that. That's not new technology. It's not very difficult. We've done that for decades in the United States, for example, and it um, they are starting to invest and build that back up again. And so although in the short term, I do see challenges on fuel supply constraints, enrichment constraints, um, there's nothing that's really that complicated about a nuclear power plant. We've imposed onerous regulations way beyond what is necessary to achieve safety. And that is a challenge. That is a problem. Um, but I think all of these things will will shift over time. And I'm not saying they're going to shift in one year or two years or three years. But I think ultimately, to, from a directional point of view, this technology will become the dominant technology to provide for thermal power. Now, bring up a good point that Currently, electricity is only 20% of the energy mix, right? I mean, so you still have 80% that's used for transportation, for ships, for planes, for all these other things. I'm not saying that nuclear power is going to replace that 80% um, overnight. Now, I think long term, the potential of synthetic fuels and other basically alternatives is potentially viable, but not in the near term. But I'm talking about the 20%, the power piece. And right now, we are ramping up radically. Like in the United States, the load forecast in 2023 from 2022 doubled. So basically, the for the grid forecasters underestimated it um, significantly due to the rapid uh, advance of manufacturing and data centers. We're put basically 200 new manufacturing facilities that just shy of $500 billion are being invested in the United States, $150 billion in new data centers all in the next five years. This is all happening. So we're seeing massive new load growth. We're basically going to triple the amount of electricity that is used in data centers. So in the US today, about 2.5% of electricity just goes to power data centers. By looking at some of the projections on the high end, it could be 7.5% of all electricity in the United States will be consumed just in data centers um, by the year 2030. So there's a huge ramp up of power needs. So I think that's the area that nuclear power is going to address is this new load that is coming online in Western developed countries that are embracing new technologies like AI and, manu and new manufacturing. Well, gentlemen, it's been a very enlightening conversation. Great hearing both of your views on the energy space and where it's headed. I'm sure the viewers got a ton out of it as well. Before I do let you go, uh, Steve, tell us about the SRS Rocco report, where people can find that and what it is you do there. Yeah, Jesse, thanks. And it was great, Brian, talking with you. Uh, yeah, I put out data on how the energy is changing and and how it, how it impacts the economy, the mining industry, 
um, and financial assets. And I'm very, very concerned about financial assets. I think they're hugely overvalued. So I, I look at the details of how the energy is changing. And again, if my analysis is correct, I think we start to get in trouble after 2025. So I want people to understand how that's changing on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, because it's going to impact the rest of the world and the, the global economy. And I think it's very important to understand. That's why, even though I used to look at, I'm a very big believer in precious metals in the mining industry, I, I put energy first. Energy is the number one factor that, that impacts the entire economy. And so that's what we do at the SRS Rock Report. And I'm also very busy on Twitter at the SRS Rock Report Twitter handle. Great. Well, I'll put a link to the website and your Twitter as well. Uh, Brian, tell us about your book, In the Dark, Fixing Energy Policies That Hurt People and the Planet, and where people can find that. Yeah, thanks. And this is a great conversation, Steve. And I, I, I think it's really important for analysis like yours to get out there, because I think we need to educate more people on some of these challenges coming ahead. I think we're where I'm coming from with writing this book, for example, in the dark, is I think we I, we need to also address some of the upstream fundamental challenges with the energy narrative. As I started off our conversation, too many of our leaders and politicians, whether they be investors, corporate leaders, um, people doing policy making, believe in these foundational myths that I think are leading us in the wrong direction. So I, I wrote in the dark specifically to condense down everything that I've learned over the last 20 years working in the energy industry into basically a one hour read. I wanted this to be very streamlined, simple, accessible, something that someone could pick up in one sitting and read it in about an hour and have it be very fact-based with, uh, it has over 150 citations in it to various data that's driving it so that someone could understand it, the big picture view, some of these fundamental challenges that we face from a policy perspective, because we definitely need to change. We are going in a very dangerous direction on from a policy perspective. And I think we need to change the energy narrative. And I think to do that, more of these decision makers need to understand some of these foundational myths and what are the better ways moving forward. So, I mean, my whole mission is I want us to use more energy in better forms of energy over time. And people can find the book at just my personal website, briangit.com. That's B-R-I-A-N-G-I-T-T.com. Or they can follow me on Twitter at Brian Git. And I try to share as much knowledge and information as I find as often as I can. Great. Well, I'll put links to the Twitter and your website where people can grab a copy of In the Dark as well. Thanks once again to both of you for coming on. It's been a great conversation. Thanks, Thank Jesse. You. Appreciate it.